for the chairman of ABB, who started this organization. And in this position, I'm sure, you know, you're leading the efforts of the organization, kind of defining, setting the tone for its culture, particularly around ESG, right? So that's a new term, environmental, social, and global issues. Um, so let me ask you, so I'm, I'm sure you, your head wasn't in the sand. You became very aware, like the rest of us, around the murder of George Floyd last year, you know, exactly around this time, May 25th was his, the date of his murder. murder. But I'm curious to know, right, because we're talking about executive response to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I mean, what was your response? I mean, as a leader of this organization, even personally, like, what did you do? Yeah. So, you know, I think part of our stuff goes back a few years earlier. I was very fortunate to be introduced to this professor at Northwestern called Al Tillery, who started the Center for the Study of Diversity and Democracy. And I think part of it is just being vulnerable. The first time I met Al, we talked and you know, he asked about my background. I said, you know, my four grandparents came over from Ireland. And he said, have you ever read the book, uh, How the Irish Became White? And it was kind of just an interesting bridging a gap. And, and Al started the center really focusing on how to go advance the causes of making sure that at one point, uh, the American populace was more willing to vote for a black man than a white woman. So gender bias in politics is really strong. We also launched our... Um, our DEI council in 2018, same time I met Al. So Al came out and has been a really good voice for us. So when this happened a year ago, we actually had a town hall where we had three of our black colleagues talk and there was not a dry eye in the house. To understand from the perspective of your colleagues what they go through as a mom, as a spouse, as a, an employee, and uh, I think that really helped codify the whole company. So we've really been very much on the forefront, I think, of making sure that we're open and receptive to how to go promote DEI in our company and in our communities. So we came out with statements. We've done multiple uh, town halls on the subject. We say ABD, uh, DEI is in our DNA, and we really do walk the walk. So I'm happy to kind of share more details as we go through this. But there's the public and private pieces on this where, you know, talking about being vulnerable and accountable. When I feel uncomfortable with something, I feel like I have a couple of really close allies in the company. I can say, okay, I'm thinking about it this way. What what am I missing? And those are the pieces too. I would say the backdrop of this conversation, if you're not putting yourself out there where you're gonna make a little bit of a small mistake, you're probably not growing enough. And so having that kind of acceptance and saying, we're gonna go talk about this stuff. And I may say something that's incorrect, but having the acceptance and the vulnerability to go do that on both sides is part of that growth. And I think that's where we've been succeeding as a company. So it's interesting that that you, meaning ABD, started its its kind of journey. I call it the diversity journey, kind of predating George Floyd, because I think there's a lot of organizations, especially in the insurance industry, that just kind of you know woke up, right? Became woke, as as, as some would say, um, post the murder. And so you know it's interesting that you already had some sense of awareness. And I'm sure, right, throughout kind of the process, even you know, engaging with consultants and, and trying to figure out internally what you were going to do. I mean, you had questions, right? I mean, you didn't know this is what we're going to do today, and I have it all figured out, right? I mean, I'm sure you had, even as a leader of this organization, huh? Maybe, maybe I don't have all the answers to <laughs> what I'm doing, <laughs> right? I would assume. Totally, yeah. Well, you know, I think part of this too is I think this is a journey. This is an education. And, you know, I think when we were talking a couple weeks ago, there was a, I think a 13 year old chess player who came out with this quote saying, I don't lose, I learn, right? So every time there's, there's something that happens along the way. And this is a whole learning journey for, I think everybody, because things continue to evolve and change. And even like with Al, who is a DEI authority, he is an expert. His students challenge him on terms and say, you, you, you are not doing enough. And so this balance of, you know, how do you make sure you're staying current with the right terms? You know, is it Latinx. I didn't know what that meant the first time I saw it. I was like, what is that? And so being able to go ask that in a way saying, totally understand now. Or like even going into um, this journey of, I, there are some things that I, I've done that have helped me. The IICF, the Insurance Industry Charitable Foundation, does an inclusion event every year. So next week actually is the IICF event this year. Um, I went to the one in New York a couple years ago for women in leadership, and of 600 attendees, there were six men, and the rest were women. And so for me to be in that position, to sit down, every table I sat down at, I was the only man. And to go hear the stories of what women go through is a different perspective than what I was understanding. And so even that colors this whole discussion of, okay, how do you look at things from a different view? And 
our colleagues look at things in their view, right? So I think it's the lens that you're looking through. And so trying to broaden that lens is part of this navigation of learning and being tolerant and understanding on all sides. I would totally agree. And, and I almost look at it. So, you know, here you are, again, C-suite executive of this organization. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure we have some individuals who aren't in those roles kind of in our audience. And, and oftentimes, I think as employees, employee base, we put individuals like you who are in these executive positions, like on this godlike pedestal, right? Like you have to know what's going on. You're making solutions, identifying problems, right? You're knowing what decisions to be made when, right? You know it all. And, and I get it, right? I mean, you, you as a C-suite individual are running multi-millions, billions, even dollar organizations. You have hundreds, you have thousands of people under you. You've been groomed, you've been mentored, you've been sponsored in order to be in the position you are today, right? But I mean, let's be real to your point. All of that grooming, all of that mentoring, all of that sponsoring doesn't necessarily take into account, right, how to manage diversity, right? You, you manage the business, you manage the resources related to the business, but I think even though, you know, we've identified, I mean, there's been a number of studies that says diversity is a business imperative, no one has actually said, okay, Brian, this is how you do it, <laughs> this is how you do it. And I think, you know, as employees, we have to take that into consideration because that this term that we're talking about, like vulnerability, is recognizing, right, that I don't have all the answers, recognizing that I can make, you know, decisions that impact thousands, that impact millions of dollars, but I might not have all the right answers as it relates to this diversity conversation. Um, and one more thing you made me think about, kind of additionally, um, when we talk about diversity and diversity journeys, I think we cannot forget that as individuals, that it's our lived experiences, right? It's how we were raised, it's you know, what we were taught as, as you know, from our parents, from people we engage with that shape our perceptions, our interactions, our biases as we become adults. And then even ultimately as we become leaders, right? As we lead organizations and people. So we can't forget like, for instance, I'm gonna pick on you a little bit, Brian, like even as a white man, right? I mean, you probably grew up or maybe I'm, I don't wanna make assumptions, but I know a lot of my colleagues, even my colleague, Megan, um, uh, Stuart Hodge, who, who we've, we've co-created the trilogy, you know, we talk about the fact that she was even raised in this household where she was taught to be colorblind, right? And so, you know, all the great intentions around her parents just trying to, you know, to help her, um, you know, deal with a society where, you know, maybe color or discrimination was, was rampant, that to appreciate people that you kind of, you negate their, you know, who they were, right, and their color. And so this concept of colorblind, you know, even as, you know, an, an aspect of how we were raised gets brought into our world as adults and as leaders. And so that kind of shapes how we deal with diversity, even in, you know, these situations. And so I just find it very interesting that even, you know, if we have leaders who have not really had a very extensive diversity journey, right, um, who might not have dealt with discrimination, who, who might not have, you know, you know, been engaged in conversations uh, related to um, appreciating differences and dealing with people who aren't like you, that when they get into these leadership positions, it even compounds it even more as to, okay, so what do I do? How do I deal with this, right? How do I lead others around uh, coping and dealing with and addressing diversity within our organization? So I think sometimes you get, we have to think beyond just the fact that, you know, you know, diversity is a business imperative, Right. But really, how do we address it as individuals and individuals who are leading organizations? Well, you know, I think it's interesting, too, because one of the reasons why I think I was invited to have this chat with you is because we've done a couple of searches with Hanover and with Kate and James in particular. Um, you know, we did a search for the CEO of the WBN mm -hmm. and really making sure that, you know, when we talk about recruiting diverse talent, it has to start. Like, that's one of the core principles of our DEI Council advancing talent, communications, recruiting, you know, leadership commitment, inclusive culture and values, and employee involvement are our six kind of pillars of our DEI Council. But I think one of the reasons why I was invited to this is because when I'm working with recruiters or working to recruit, I mean, I'm, I am saying from the front, we want to see a diverse candidate pool. We want to see a mixed group of people because we really do believe in this. And so that starts with one of the basic premises that I'll share kind of a quick vulnerable story that maybe people on the line can can take to heart. Like I kind of look at the business, like I put my house up and started the business, put like my savings in and everything. So 
with six other people, seven other people. We started this business by going all in. And like we love this business. We care about this business deeply. And we really do care about DEI as part of our DNA. We have a whole bunch of ERGs, and I kind of look at this and say, one of the ERG meetings, ABD, her, um, you know, there were some comments being made about, well, listen, I can't get this done. And I said in this meeting, is this just because you're a woman or does everybody inside of ABD, are they still going through the same question? And I kind of got looked at kind of a little cocked head and I said, it's like the same thing. Does the computer not work for you because you're a woman or does the computer not work because it doesn't work for everybody inside of ABD? And the whole room kind of went silent. And I was like, wow. And so later I talked to one of my allies in the group and she said, you know, Brian is probably a good question, but the fact that you're a white man asking that in the ABD her, it's like, nobody wants to, get, it might've been different if a woman had asked the question, but for you to ask the question in a male pale and stale industry, it's a challenge. And so I would just say, this is another just coaching piece. Like when you're in that group, be all in, focus on the groups that you're working with, because when you try and look at the needs of everybody, that's different than looking at the needs of what you're trying to do to advance the cause of your colleagues. And I think that's something that I've, I've like had to shift this thing. You know, like I have three boys. Sorry, my wife and I have three boys, right? I love them all dearly. Um, and sometimes one of them needs more attention than the others. And the other two, the, the one that needs all that attention doesn't need to know what's going on in my head about the other two. They need all my attention there. And so I think that's just kind of a, a learning piece as you go through, because when you're all in, you learn more. And so you get a little bit more authentic and you get to the real meat of the matter. So again, part of this is listening and understanding. And I could say the same thing with, you know, our uh, Black at ABD ERG. It's like, you, sometimes I'll say something and it's not meant to be um, wrong. It's like, I'd sit there and say, here's another example. Our goal for uh, Black at ABD is to be 13% Black as a company. Mm-hmm. But when I look at the Bay Area in San Francisco, um, the, it's just under 4% black colleagues here or black population right. getting to 13% in the Bay area is hard. And so if I ask that question the wrong way, it's like, we have to go figure out how to go build in areas where are more predominantly black than in San Mateo County, which is mostly white and Asian. And so these are the questions, but you have to ask that the right way. And the, and then the people you're talking with have to understand that these are logical questions to try and say, we believe in these goals, but how do we attain them together? How do we look and say, okay, what do we need to do to go reverse recruit and promote our talented uh, uh, you know, people? And you know, how do we wanna make sure that we make the heads count, not count heads? So it's interesting, so you're kind of kind of alluding to the title of our, our of our conversation, right? What did you say, right? So, you know, we started off the conversation talking about the statements, right? Even, you know, ABD put out a statement. There's many organizations, uh, again, even focusing on the insurance and finance industry that put on statements, whether it's on their websites, whether it's on social media, even, you know, their CEOs and C-suite, you know, making, um, you know, videos or, or whatnot with those statements. And so I think kind of, you know, what we're alluding to around this, what did you say, is now that the statement has been made, we're one year away from that, you know, I think employees, our industry, were questioning, okay, so you said something, and <laughs> what's next? And I think you're alluding to kind of the fact that those statements need to have some meat behind them. And I think, you know, the industry has been waiting, the greater industry has been waiting for those actions to happen. And I know there's been many webinars that have talked about, okay, action, we need to do something. But I think also, you know, the conversation needs to be around that accountability, right? So you got C-suite people making statements about what they want to do, what they want to see, how, you know, social injustice needs to end. But then, you know, we, we don't necessarily see the action and we haven't yet, we haven't even seen additional statements around some of the other social injustices that have been happening in our country over the last 12 months, right? And so I think it, it starts to have people think about, okay, so, you know, your statement, was it, did it have any, you know, anything behind it, right? And so, you know, I, I, I like to hear that ABD is kind of putting that meat behind it, putting the action behind it, because I think that's what's so important. That's what the industry wants to see. But then it starts to make it real for so many people, right? That you weren't just kind of following the crowd. And I think, you know, one question I want to ask you, and I want full truth and disclosure. <laughs> yeah. Remember, remember our rule is authentic. <laughs> we're going to be authentic. But, you know, I, like as you look across the industry and you look at your peers, right, and I'm sure, you know, you have colleagues 
at the same level view that have put out these statements. Kind of what are your thoughts around that where you, where you don't see colleagues uh, in, in different organizations put the action behind those statements that they made? Yeah, you know, it's really, it's interesting because um, one of our colleagues, Ivy Robinson, um, has an amazing story. She's been doing the insurance for Black Lives Matter for four years now. And originally when she started writing it here, she was, uh, I was going to say, like, didn't want to share with people that she was writing the insurance for Black Lives Matter. And then all this happened. She got invited to go before Congress and talk about how hard it is to go get insurance for nonprofits, particularly nonprofits that may have some kind of, you know, a uh, fringe impression on it. And so trying to make sure like our business is really trying to figure out. So it's a it's a war on talent. And so I think for a lot of people on the line. It's like this is something where you know we started putting resources behind our ERGs, and even like when we talked a couple of weeks ago, you know, like we were talking about um, HBCUs and like the perception of like we're doing some things there, but again, there are more HBCUs than we're doing anything with. So like I look to our Black at ABD ERG to try and help us figure out how do we go grow and do that, and we put real dollars behind the sponsorships and the opportunities for them to go make a difference. After the uh, George Floyd town hall, we put a, we put $10,000 up as a matching grant to our employees to say we support Black Lives Matter and those causes. And so here are five different you know, uh, nonprofits that we, we support. We'll match your grants up to $10,000 to go do that. I think getting everyone to know that we're putting our money where our mouth is, not just with our, our black colleagues, but our other AR, ERGs are... Pride ERG, our ABD Her, um, our Ola ERG just started, which is our Latin ERG, and really making sure that this is something where people can bring their authentic self. Now, that being said, I actually have a, uh, well, I'm going to go two things. One, I think for the people that are looking to go recruit, young people coming into the industry want to know that they can go bring their authentic self. If you're, you know, over a certain age, you've been told like, hey, guess what, show up and, you know, wear a white shirt and turn off the lights when you leave, and these are all the things you do that you got taught like when I when I got out of college, right? I think today's work environment is really different. I think the pandemic's changed that too, where like we are 100% remote workforce. You can work wherever you want as long as you can get your job done. So all the other kind of stereotypes that go with coming to the office, like you know, people showing up and working in their slippers or their PJs or whatever on a Zoom call, that's kind of changed. Our ability to go get talent everywhere has certainly changed our business because we can go recruit in areas that are more diverse than San Mateo County. So I think those things are changes for as you're looking at your business and recruiting, like we recognize that if we want to keep growing, we're going to have to attract the best and the brightest and the best and the brightest want to go work where they can go be authentic. That being said, I think there's an interesting dichotomy now where some of our colleagues that are, I would say, uh, Republican or Trump supporters or, you know, dive in the wool, white people don't feel like they can bring their authentic self too. And so that's an interesting piece trying to figure out how do you make sure you have a completely inclusive culture because it's not just the opinions that are popular that matter. It should be all the opinions and trying to figure out how to have a clarity around those pieces. So it is interesting. We had our our Pride ERG kickoff with Pride Month last week. And I did get a couple of notes saying, you know, I feel a little uncomfortable with this. I can't bring my authentic self or my clients don't reflect this too. And it's an interesting piece on how do you go try and manage a, an evolving situation and understanding. And um, I know where the future is, but you also have to deal with the present. And I think it's a fine balance to try and make sure you don't leave people behind. You want to bring them along. No, Mo, definitely. And I agree with that. And so that's why, I, I again, I, I find it interesting kind of all the, the uh, initiatives that ABD is doing internally. Um, and, and applaud you for, for, you know, as a leader within your organization, kind of owning it, right? Saying that this is this is my organization. I've you know put blood, sweat, and tears into it, right? This is the culture that I want to define and I want to lead. And this is what we're going to do um, to make sure that inclusive culture is is established within our organization. And so, you know, maybe we can kind of get back to it later in the conversation. But you know, I think you're you're one organization out of an industry of thousands, right? Not every leader is doing what you're doing. Not every leader is showing up and saying, yes, I made this statement, but I'm going to put action behind it. And so I'm really curious because, you know, I think part of these conversations, we've had so many DEI conversations over the last year in our industry. You know, people talk a lot, 
<laughs> people talk a lot. And so I'm really, you know, I'm more, you know, especially as a consultant and as I come into organizations, hoping them to define and execute on their DEI strategies. It's really for me about, you know, not just talking the talk, but what are you going to do, right? And what is the call to action, right? And so holding others accountable within our industry where maybe we normally wouldn't. So I'm kind of curious, you know, again, as you st stand as this leader of diversity within your organization, what are those conversations you're having outside to say, okay, hey, I'm doing something because this is what I believe. There's a business imperative related to this. What are you doing? Yeah. So, and sorry, I didn't answer the question before too. So okay, that's uh, okay. You know, getting back, getting back we'll get to, back. Uh, well, I, I do think that like we have, we use social media very effectively and we have had like dozens, if not more comments coming from competitors, employees saying, my employer has not put out a statement. My employer has not done anything. I do not feel like I can be there. I love what ABD is doing. So I would just say to those competitors, like if you're not addressing this now, you're in for trouble. Like this is something where you have to be doing this on a daily basis and putting this into your your daily mindset of how to go make sure you're building a company that's going to reflect the, the not just the clients you want to serve, but the employees that are going to bring, bring you the best. And there are a whole bunch of business statistics that I think, you know, not only is doing this the right thing to do, it's the right thing for the business. And so I think, you know, I look at these pieces and look at some of these groups and talk to other people, like the WBN search was really interesting because there were some things said by colleagues. I'm like, you did not just say that, <laughs> right? So, you know, and again, and you can look at this and say, we're dealing with a global issue. And you talked about um, the ESG, Globally, the U.S. in some ways is ahead of some countries and behind some countries. Mm -hmm. But when you hear things from colleagues in other places, like you can hire a woman because you can pay her less than a man. You're like, what? Did you just yeah. say that? Like, so, and these are the pieces where you, you, like for me, you're like, that is not, you know, you pay the same for the same work, right? Mm -hmm. You lead and you say, guess what? These are the things that I've learned. You know, there's a piece on trying to figure out how to manage for profitability and manage for long term. Um, you know, when you look at some of the McKenzie studies about having a 47% greater return on equity or 55% higher operating results, those are things that you can actually use to go make people sit up and, and, and notice. So it's not just, again, the right thing to do. It's also the right thing to do for the business. And so, you know, I think continuing to have these dialogues and when you hear, like, I love the, the topic of this conversation. What did you just say? Because I still hear things. That I'm like, you know, you know, it's like somebody's just jamming on the brakes, like, like, <laughs> Because like, I think people don't, I mean, I think people don't understand some of these pieces. So part of this is that kind of collective intelligence and growth together based off of what preconceived notions are. And again, I think you mentioned earlier, our insurance business is predominantly male, pale and stale. We joke about it, right? So like ABD is setting different targets and we're looking to our peer groups as we work with the CIAB groups or WBN groups where we're saying, here's what we're doing. How do we work together to go achieve these, these you know, goals? So, I, so it's interesting, kind of the, the what did you say um, reference. Um, we keep kind of threading that through our conversation. And so, you <laughs> you know, I chuckled a little bit when you indicated, you know, the comment that a colleague made about hiring a woman. And so, you know, it's interesting because, you know, as a consultant, I'm engaging not only with executives, but, you know, middle management, you know, entry level, right? Trying to figure out, right, how do we move diversity forward within a organization? And I think oftentimes what happens, and so... This is another question. I know I'm like drilling you with questions today, Brian. But, but I think, you know, one of the things we're starting to realize is that, you know, there is this, this you know, perception around power, right? And we, you know, power and privilege has been used, thrown around a lot lately. Again, as we talk about race, as we talk about marginalized groups, as we talk about allyship and all that stuff. And so I was on a panel, you know, maybe uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week, the days are running together, but we started to talk about power, but not necessarily with the negative connotation or a positive one, like power is power, right? Everyone has power to some level or degree. It's all about how you use it, right? That makes it a negative or a positive. And so right. one of the things I, you know, maybe want to spend a little bit of time talking about is like when you have situations where you have colleagues calling out, saying things that, you know, you're like, uh, I don't know if that was the right thing to say, or, you know, it, it, that was offensive, or that was hurtful, or that, you know, some level of microaggression, you know, I'm curious to know, like, what power are you, you know, how are you empowering your employees 
to, to do something, say something in response. Because as a leader, right? I mean, that's part of kind of shifting the culture, right? Allowing people to have power around moving diversity forward. And part of that is responding to microaggressions and hurtful comments um, and, and acts of discrimination and not being criticized for doing that or retaliated against or felt, you know, you know, fearful of, of doing that. So how do you create that where you have employees who can have the power and feel empowered to, to make those call outs? Yeah. So, you know, again, there's a number of things here that can make you feel really uncomfortable and, you know, saying one thing the wrong way can end somebody's career. Right. And so you look at this and say, like being vulnerable, being authentic, and also having allies, we can say, okay, I feel really uncomfortable with this request, or am I, you know, out of line here and thinking about these things and having people that you can go to um, is really important. And I think for us, we are very fortunately, like we started the company, we branded as the ABD team. And I like to joke, we play team ball. So it's not me just doing this alone. This is like Kurt and Paige and Amy and Ivory and Shauna and our DEI council, like they're driving things that, you know, again, in some cases they're pushing them maybe a little more than I would want to go. And I, I mean, I could use an example that, you know, our um, Black at ABD ERG just asked for a lot of money to go sponsor uh, three different groups that they want to go really get close to. And it's a lot of money. And so at the end of the day you're going, okay, are we a social enterprise or are we a business? We're both, right? So that that is our piece. But we've had, you know, colleagues say, you know, is this a good investment? And part of this is you're not going to find out until down the road. Right. And so that's part of how we're looking at this thing and managing those pieces. So, you know, going back to the questions, like I, I get uncomfortable on some of this all the time because I don't know. And at the end of the day, you're trying to say, OK, how do you make the right decision? And, and I can only do that with look, looking and relying on my colleagues. Right. So right. then we can sit there and say, OK, here's what we are going to fund. Here's what we are going to do, um, you know, and going back to that one piece, like I don't want one child to think that they're more special than the other children. They're all special. And you got to make sure that everyone's looking out and saying, OK, how do we build this company that isn't ostracizing or leaving anybody behind? This is a journey we're all on together. And when you join ABD, you know that this is part of our DNA. So that's that is something that we want to really make sure we reiterate. I do think that other companies are coming you know, becoming more aware of this, because as we're looking, we're growing really, we're growing quickly, and we keep winning awards for best place to work. I think I mentioned like one of our last calls, you know, three years ago, three, I say two, three, and four years ago, in our best places to work survey, challenging, fun, and flexible were our three key words. Um, last year, inclusive was the number one word on why people love ABD, and so really putting that into the forefront and. You know, some of the stuff is a little uncomfortable, but, um, you know, I, I love this quote from um, the CEO of Hamilton Insurance. Um, Alda Pino is amazing. And um, she has this great quote, open minds, open doors. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's like, if you think about these things, like if you go in with an open mind and try and figure out how to go make sure you bring everyone along and you can do it in a way where if, when I say something bad, not if, when I say something wrong, I don't get persecuted. And I feel like, okay, you want to know something? I can actually try and talk about this stuff and know that people will have a loving attitude towards trying to build this, then I feel more comfortable doing it. So that uncomfortable piece becomes more comfortable. And I think that's when everyone makes more progress, but that's having great allies and great associates and great people to make sure that you can go do that. So that's, that's what I would advise other colleagues that have this opportunity is surround yourself with really good people and make sure that you have a trusting working relationship on that. Well, I mean, trust is key, right? I mean, even to your example that you gave earlier when you were in the ABD HER and you made that comment, I mean, you had a trusted colleague that was like, okay, wait a minute, Brian. <laughs> we love you. But... It wasn't until after, though. It wasn't until after. <laughs> well, I mean, but that's, but it still was feedback. And I think that's, I mean, you know, if, if you didn't trust her feedback and she didn't trust you enough to, you know, for you to take it and be constructive about it. I think that's kind of the culture 
which that needs to exist. And I think organizations need to understand that that trust that, that employees have with leaders and leaders have with employees is kind of the foundation around creating inclusive environments, right? If I can't trust that I am able to bring my authentic, authentic self, like if I can't trust the fact that I'm able to call you out and you, you know, understand why and digest why that that might have been a bad comment or whatever the case might be and not take offense to it, then I'm more comfortable to your point about, you know, doing what I need to do and moving this diversity conversation forward. So, you know, I, I agree with you. I mean, as leaders within organizations, I mean, understanding that there's key components, characteristics of a culture that you have to create foundationally before you can say we're inclusive, before you can say we're diverse, right? Because if everyone's not feeling, even those that might, you know, call out, uh, reverse discrimination or cancel, you know, uh, cancel culture, right? I mean, these are terms that we're hearing in response to kind of the, the, the push towards diversity and, and the heightened awareness around um, racial injustice that we have maybe some, some white counterparts that are like, okay, whoa, wait, <laughs> wait, I almost feel like you're, you're canceling me out. And then, you know, like that as a, as a, uh, a white individual within this organization, I'm being replaced, not included, right? And so I think we have to be careful to your point about those conversations that we're creating these trusting environments. And it starts with the top, obviously, right? It starts with leaders like yourself who are, who are willing to establish that trust on the onset and then have it trickle down or be mirrored in other situations and other relationships within the organization. So I agree with you on that. Um, but I also wanted to go back, like you mentioned, you know, one thing you and I talked about before is about representation and recruiting and all that. And you've been mentioning examples of what a ABD does even within its organization. But I, you know, I ask you because I, I have this conversation with leaders all the time. Is that ultimately the end goal? Is that ultimately where we put our stake in the ground and say, okay, we've accomplished. When we get to that 13% of black employees within our organization, we're good. Right. I mean, is that what we're trying to accomplish at the end of the day? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think this is kind of um, it's, it's like uh, software on your iPhone. It always keeps getting better. It always keeps <laughs> right. getting better right? So it's, a, like it's a moving target. So I think the target today is to make sure we're fixing all the bugs. Right. To so make sure we're trying to figure out how to go make sure this is the best operation. You, you know, one of the examples that I think is, is interesting is um, we had a transgender call for our uh, leaders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was growing up, Bruce Jenner was an American hero. You know, he won the decathlon. He was on the Wheaties box and everything. And as we're going through this transgender piece, I asked a question like, so is Caitlyn Jenner a seen as a hero to the transgender community? And the answer was, well, not because not necessarily because of the politics. And so it gets confusing. It's like you sit there and go, OK, these lines keep getting blurred and like and they're going to continue to evolve. Right. right? So. I can't tell you what's what the population in the United States is going to be like in 10 years. I hope that we're reflective of what the communities we're serving and the people we want to hire. Like we really do want the best and the brightest. And the fact that we can go work anywhere, I think gives us that opportunity to go do that. And I think remote workforce is not just for ABD, that's for everybody. And so when you put on your recruiting hat, it's like, how do you identify the best talent? And the best talent should be reflective of a diverse workforce. So and there are lots of different ways to go look at that. But like, you know, again, like when I was growing up, very different time and how we looked at different things, right? And I grew up in New York and I went to school in Chicago and I've been out here in San Francisco. I think San Francisco is arguably the, you know, a, a one of the most liberal cities in the country. And if I think about a place that is forgiving and open to, you know, cultural differences, I'd put San Francisco at the top. And yet we've had Asian hate crimes going on here, which I sound like, are you kidding me? So... Yeah. It's it's crazy because so, so I when I put that filter on that like if you told me that five years ago I'd be like no way, right. but these things continue to uh, you know ebb and flow. So I think these are moving targets, and I you know I don't I don't know if quota is the right piece. It's like it's like you know when you're doing the right thing could because your people are telling you, and you feel good. You win awards when you're doing the right thing. You win awards. You know so. So I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> No, and I appreciate that because I, I do think, you know, it, it, it is an evolution to some degree, right? Um, and I do think it, it does continue to change as our society, for instance, continues to brown, right? Or as, you know, uh, uh, 
Christianity no longer becomes the number one religion, right? Like these are things that are going to change the way we engage and what representation look like looks like. But I, I really asked the question because I think, you know, there's a part of, you know, as a consultant, what I believe is that, you know, we're, we're in this diversity conversation, we're having this diversity conversation, and we're in it for the now, right? We're addressing to your problem, to your comment, the bugs, right? Trying to kind of fix going through all the updates that we need to go through. But I think sometimes we fall short of realizing what potentially the end game looks like. Right. So I think sometimes we look at the end game around, you know, the numbers as far as people and purely related to talent. But if we were being honest about what diversity is and its impact, diversity not only impacts our talent, but it impacts every functional area that exists within not only our industry, but our society. So, you know, I, I challenge leaders, you know, uh, across the board when I engage with them, like when we talk about what is the end goal. It's about when your underwriter picks up a piece of business from a black agent, is that immediate response because it's coming from a black agent that there's biases that get projected into how they look at the risk, how they engage with that agent, right? So starting to say, okay, diversity, yes, we have, we're increasing the number of, of you know, black individuals we have in the organization, we're increasing the number of women, but it really becomes sustainable and a part of our everyday you know, functionality when we can start to embed diversity in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Like even looking at the claims process. So, you know, we know adjusters, especially, you know, we have examples of it in Katrina, when Katrina happened, where we had adjusters who had, again, biases against some of the, the clients and the insureds. And the claims administration process was compromised because of the discrimination that existed in that population of, of insureds. Right, and so how do we get to the point where we're looking at diversity beyond just talent and counting numbers about representation? And, and not that I say that's a bad thing because we got to start somewhere, right? Those are where the bugs are initially. And in order for you to understand the cultures and the, the ethnicities and the differences that, that we'll be engaging in, you have to have people who, who represent that. So I get that that's where we have to start. But you know, I'm, I, you know, I kind of pose the question because I'd like to explore the conversation and we're like, where do we take it post-talent? When we've gotten to the point where we've gotten the numbers and we're, we're feeling good about the inclusion, we're feeling good about everyone feeling a sense of belonging, there's trust in the culture, what's next? Where do we take it from there? And I think that's one of the things the industry, meaning the insurance industry, has to start to think about because we're getting to a point that the awareness around diversity is here. Right. I mean, we've been talking diversity for a year now. Granted, it ebbs and flows over, over the decades. I've been in the insurance industry 25 years. Right. And diversity is not a new conversation. It's, it's just a more, a more apparent one that we're having today. But again, I guess, you know, what are your thoughts about like, where do we take it after the talent conversation comes to to some leveling point? Well, you know, I think that even having events like this is terrific because I think you have to keep the discussion vibrant and alive and relevant. And I think there have been moments in the past you could sit there and say, okay, guess what? We've had spikes of, you know, civil discourse and protests, and then it drops off. Mm -hmm. And you can look at the last 20, 30, 40 years, and you can see these different spikes. So I think one thing that's changed um, is really kind of this ability of social media impact things and keep things relevant. Um, my son's working on a project with um, uh, Al about the impact of how things are different today than when Colin, Colin Kaepernick was protesting four mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about that standpoint, like he was basically shunned and yeah. and outlawed from yeah. the NFL. And you look at today, the position on the NBA, MLB, or um, uh, the NFL on, on these positions, and they, ha they have to adopt. Players can strike. There's more power in trying to figure out how to go keep this current and people look to those athletes as heroes. And so I think keeping the discourse going and the dialogue going is really important. I think the other piece is just this learning progress. Like one of the searches we did, um, you know, my top candidate was, uh, was a female and it took like an extra four months to recruit her. And having the foresight to know that sometimes it takes longer for people to make a decision based off of what they're going through. I think three or four years ago, I would have said, okay, she's not interested. Let's go to the number two candidate who would have been a man. And so I think trying to keep those pieces as you learn on this journey, uh, you know, those pieces are going to continue to evolve too. And so, you know, I think trying to make sure that like we don't have a set quota per se, 
We just know that we're trying to move the ball forward. And our mm-hmm. colleagues and our team are the ones that are helping us balance that, saying, hey, guess what? Like, we need more help over here. I think that's going to be part of this whole narrative of, like, if you don't adopt this stuff, people are not going to want to work for you. Like, so we just um, hired somebody in New York who's amazing. Derek is a claims expert. But I think part of his recruiting was, like, he checked with a couple of black colleagues at ABD to make sure this is a place where he wanted to work. And um, there's a great book uh, by Daniel Pink called To Sell as Human. And one of the things in there, it's, you know, it used to be uh, buyer beware. Now it's seller beware because people can go check out stuff and say, is what Brian's saying true? They can go check on social media. They can go check with people they know. And if you're not aware of that, then people are going to say, okay, you are not being authentic. You're lying. And so mm-hmm. those things will be even more damaging. So I think as we're pulling through in the go forward, everyone needs to be cognizant of that is where things are at and where they're going. And that seller beware piece, if you're trying to build a business with people, which most businesses are, you're going to have to make sure you have this at the forefront of your discussions and have that kind of authentic place where people feel like they can, they want to work. They want to go invest their, their time. There's, there's a, a friend who has a car dealership here. Um, and he says he's trying to build a place. Like he's, people sell cars. He's trying to build a place where people get to work, not got to work. <laughs> and like that one letter makes a big difference, right? So that you want to sit there and say, I love working where I work. Yeah. And if you don't have this as part of your forefront, then I think you're going to be in trouble down the road. No, I agree because I think you, I totally agree with that. I mean, we there it has to be this awareness of kind of the brand, right? Um, it's interesting, you know, dealing with collegiate uh, uh, candidates, right? And this this generation of where, you know, value to them is around the S E S G components and, and how our company is responding to these, these environmental, social, and global issues. And rather than just, you know, listen to a leader, right, talk about kind of their commitment, they're doing their homework, right? They're looking at the track record of the CEO, they're looking at the track record of the organization and its board, and, you know, where it's putting its money to determine whether or not, right, this is an organization I want to work for. And I think that's one of the things, and I agree with you in the sense that, especially as we start to target different populations and bringing them into our organization or our industry, I mean, you think about HBCUs, there's 104 of them loosely. Um, and, you know, who's not going to an HBCU at this point, right? We're talking insurance industry, finance industry, technology, manufacturing. I mean, everyone's recruiting from HBCUs. And so they almost have their, their pick of the litter, if you, you know, from their perspective, in the sense that they can choose any employer that they want to because the demand is so high. But they're being very selective because they understand that diversity can be just a statement, right? Diversity can be kind of like a what did you say moment <laughs> as recruiters come to their com- their campuses talking about all the things they're doing around diversity, but there's nothing really tangible being, being shown through their track record. And so I, I agree with you. We have to be cognizant that people are looking and they're not just looking, they're researching, right? And they're demanding, right? Employees are demanding, like, this is what I want. And this is what I want my organization to be about. And if it's not, Yep. There's someone else around the corner. <laughs> right. And I think that's a very different dynamic that we've had to deal with in the insurance industry um, that we've never had to deal with before. And so I think that, you know, for, for leaders like yourself, kind of that's, you know, how are you responding and what are you doing about it becomes key. Yeah. So it's really so key. Too, it's, it's like people want to work, uh, you know, you get your best work when you, when you love what you do, you know? And so if you can go bring that to a place where people feel like they really love where they work, you're going to get better results. And again, all the statistics bear that out. Right. And so trying to figure out how do you put that into the present message and the future message, because we have, there's a lot of work to do. This is not a one and done. This is a continuous improvement uh, process. And we'll keep learning along the way. Well, you know, Listen, there's no doubt we're going to make mistakes. I just hope they're not fa- they're fatal mistakes, right? I hope they're kind of growth and you know, acceptable tolerance on how do you try and make sure you're getting things better. Um, and that's kind of, you know, that's, that's business, right? So, you know, you look at uh, VHS versus beta, beta was a better piece, but they did a bad business model, right? So it's the same thing here. You know, we know some of the things you should be doing, and I think it's pushing boundaries to try and figure out what are the right things to do today versus I think things 10 years will be very different. Um, you know, I, I told the story uh, at our pride meeting, like, you know, when I, I grew up in New York, very different time, right? So my boys here went to a school in the city. And when my boys were, uh, I don't know, 
second grade and kindergarten. My second grader looked over to my kindergarten and said, do you want to marry a boy or a girl? Because you know you have your choice. That would have made my dad roll over, right? Like, so yeah. like things continue to move. And I have friends that would still sit there and say, why are you sending your kids to school in San Francisco? And I'm super excited that they have a different lens to look on life and what's going on. That only comes from having that purview of where they're starting versus where I started versus where my grandfather started when I came over from Ireland. And that was a very different time that he said, you know, Irish need not apply. He was very bottom of the pecking order. And so things continue to evolve. And, you know, I, I can talk lots about this stuff, but it's I think that's the piece that, you know, the, 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 the recognition will continue to evolve. And the lens, as preconceived notions pass and new notions conspire, there'll be new, new problems to solve. So right. it's not like it's not like my boys or any of today's you know, younger generation have all the answers either. They'll be creating their own problems, too. <laughs> Touche. You know, and it's interesting because I, I do think there is an opportunity for organizations as, you know, this, again, this evolution continues for really to assess their organizations. I don't know, have you done an assess? I know you talked about the, kind of the employee satisfaction surveys, um, but I'm finding that, you know, leaders don't necessarily know or don't have a good handle on the temperature of their organizations around diversity, right? Um, you know, we can make assumptions, right? Because again, George Floyd happened and there's this racial tension, but maybe that's not always the issue, right? And I think, you know, to your point, understanding the evolution and understanding where we potentially might want to go and how things are changing, you first have to kind of understand where you are, right? And I think, you know, I had a client who, you know, really thought that race was kind of their issue, they had, you know, a lot of things happening, some lawsuits, um, but, you know, found out that it wasn't race, it's, it, it was ageism, right? Discrimination around age and race just happened to be, again, because of the awareness and, and George Floyd just had happened to be bubbling to the top. So, you know, forcing them to kind of take a step back and kind of relook at, okay, what, what are the issues around age that are manifesting itself within our organization and how do we address that? So I do think there's an opportunity, you know, as we prepare for the evolution, as we prepare for all these initiatives that we want to commit to going forward, that we take a temperature. Like, what do we do? What do, what do we like today? <laughs> you know, what, what are, you know, and one thing I will add before you respond is that I think also, as you take a temperature of the organization, you have to understand that your organization is made up of people, right? People who live and breathe, right? Who have opinions, who have perceptions. And I often think that sometimes we don't recognize or appreciate that these individuals who make up our organization are at different levels in their diversity journey. Some are very early on, like trying to figure out what is a microaggression? What does that mean? <laughs> like, what, you know, how do you define that? To those that have experienced more, that have been victims of discrimination, that are coping with things. And so because you have that full spectrum, you have to understand that each you know, your organization is going through the diversity journey it's in itself, but your individuals, the people that make up your organization are, are, are dealing with their own um, diversity uh, experience, so. Yeah, you know, so the word that comes to mind just thinking about this we haven't really talked about yet is empathy. So yeah. there has to be empathy on all sides here. So, you know, listen, when I left Wells Fargo almost nine years ago as a, uh, you know, middle-aged white dude trying to find a job it was hard and, yeah. and so again like and i have people that have been told at other companies that hey guess what you are you know over 50 white male there's no jobs for you here and that puts a different pressure on those individuals too and so you know trying to figure out this empathy it's like there's the broad lens there's the you know what's going on with the community what's going on with the organization what's going on with the individual everyone has a different lens um, and, you know, people don't understand like the biases that go into, you know, so Linda Yanomoto is white. She married somebody that's, that's Asian. So when she's applying, like that bias goes right to her resume. Right. And so there are things that, um, you know, accents and like, there's lots of different stuff that goes through. So the empathy of what people go through, um, Karen Taylor, who's the uh, chief diversity officer at Workday, I was on a panel with her one day and it was like, she was funny. She's like, you know, I was in this bunch of this sales conference and there was this toothy white sales leader, just like Brian. And, <laughs> you know, I hated him immediately. And he's talking about, let's go. And so she went up afterwards and Karen's awesome. And she kicked off this talk by saying, went up afterwards, you know, you just don't understand me. And he's like, I'm gay. And she's like, whoa, 
well, you just never know what what exactly. kind of pieces. And so I would say starting with some type of empathy to make sure that you get a full picture before you make any judgment. And it's really hard. Like there are preconceived notions that happen all the time. And having that empathy to make sure that you're trying to move things forward the right way and taking a full picture, that's 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 what we all have to be focused on. Totally agree. So we have, we have James back with us. So are you going to correct all the bad it. mistakes that I made, James? Are you going to fix everything that I said was wrong? Absolutely not. Uh, no, I wouldn't dare. Uh, Brian, that, that was amazing, very insightful. I think, uh, thank you so much to both of you. We, we've all learned an ex a, a lot from that conversation. Uh, I can guarantee everyone that's listening in that was very organic and unplanned. And uh, uh, I, I think it just touched on so many important points. I thought I'd just jump in right at the end to give, uh, sorry, Brian and Garzi, give someone else a chance to talk. Uh, <laughs> Just in case, if there are any questions uh, from people uh, that are listening in, um, if you just want to put it on the chat, because um, I know there's, there was a lot of information there, um, maybe as, as we're waiting for that, I just wanted to put it to both of you a question. You, you both started your own businesses um, independently and with other people, so founders, you've gone through a number of years of uh, the joys and the pains, the ups and the downs, so we all know what that's like but if you consider the topic today what we were focusing on and if you could go back and actually give yourself a little bit of advice you know what what would you actually say to yourself as that founder at that point in time well that's a loaded one because i i think for me it's it you know as i continue to do this work and I don't think for me, it's even about being a founder or an entrepreneur, but I think the, to Brian's per point, the, the journey and the evolution of diversity is I slowly started to realize, and I, I think I was aware of it before, but it, it, it just didn't manifest itself until kind of, you know, over the last couple of years. But, you know, I think there's this thing around people of color who, who kind of, we think that, you know, we always are the victim, right? And I'm not trying to say that we haven't been victimized and we aren't marginalized. But I think there's something to be said around our own biases and our own perceptions that we have that we we can't, you know, we, we think that, okay, we can't have those. We're the ones that are being victimized. But day in, day out, I mean, I'm recognizing my own biases, right? I'm recognizing where my lived experiences are creating barriers around the engagements that I have with people who aren't like me. And so even though, you know, I'm a person of color and you see me first as a, a Black woman, and, you know, I have all my other, you know, factors related to that. I think what I'm starting to learn and what I would encourage people, especially people of color, professionals of color, is that we can be biased too. <laughs> like we can have microaggressions ourselves. We can be, you know, um, you know, the, 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 the individuals who are, are delivering on those, those, those hurtful feelings or, or those uh, situations of, of, of uncomfortable nature. And so I, I, I think there has to be an awareness that we all have a diversity journey. Like we're all coping and dealing with, engaging with people who aren't like us. And it's not just left for the white man to figure it out, but we all have kind of our own role in this. And you have to check your own biases at the door before you engage. You know, so I think I would agree wholeheartedly when it goes with that. But I think the other, the other thing I would say is like looking at starting the business, like when I was coming up through business, sales was a way to be a CEO. When you were good at sales, that was the CEO. That was a path. And then it really became some of the piece on around finance, like finance, having some financial discipline was a way to go advance in companies and CFOs strategically have taken on more importance. I don't think I realized how important um, the head of people operations is to an organization. And so if I go back, here's a shout out to Amy and her team. Like our head of people ops is amazing. And so I think trying to trust that journey I don't understand some of the intricacies of HR. So having a partner there really does help. And I think I would go back and say, maybe put more investment into the people operations part of the business, because for what we do, 65 cents of every dollar we get in goes towards paying our people. That's a really important piece. So making sure the culture is right and the compensation is right and the ability to feel welcome is right is more than I would have realized nine years ago. Yeah. That's amazing. and. Uh... Perfect timing, I think, to, to wrap up. So once again, thank you so much to both of you for taking the time, participating. Uh, thank you for those that helped organizing this. Um, Rebecca, I know there was a lot of work that went into it. Um, thank you for everyone that 
joined uh, a final note uh, on a, a bit of a, a plug, I think, as we call it, a, look, a, a new website that uh, ACO is launching uh, and uh, that Hanover is uh, going to be supporting. So it's a thousandblackinterns.org. Uh, it's a new initiative that will be going across uh, the US and focusing on insurance and finance industries. So please do have a look out at that. Uh, we will follow up as well with a survey to everyone. Always good to get some notes and uh, anything we can improve on. But if we wrap up very timely, which is amazing. Thank you so much for, to everyone. And we'll speak to you all soon. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Brian, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much. All right. Likewise. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.